Three, the time for member statements has concluded. Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why did it take the threat of being humiliated at an international climate conference for the Prime Minister to commit to net zero? Weren't the bushfires enough? The members on my right, the Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Only this Leader of the Opposition would seek to politicise the bushfires, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Only members the Leader on both of the Opposition. Sides. That reflects on him, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker over the course of this year, the COP26 date has been set very clearly and methodically over the course of the year, the government has worked to come together to enable us to be able to confirm the policy, which enables me this evening to head firstly to the G20, Mr Speaker, and then to the COP26 in Glasgow and be very clear that Australia's nationally determined contribution is that we have a target of net zero emissions by 2050. And in addition to that, Mr Speaker, we'll be able to update our nationally determined contribution to indicate that our target of 26 to 28 per cent of emissions reduction by 2030 will indeed be exceeded, and we will see a 35 per cent reduction in emissions. This is what Australia is achieving. Mr Speaker, already we have seen a 20 per cent, actually 20.8 per cent reduction in emissions in emissions, Mr Speaker, which exceeds the performance of the United States of Canada, of New Zealand, of Japan, Mr Speaker, Australia is getting this job done. Now, what our performance has demonstrated, Mr Speaker, be that the highest rate of rooftop solar uptake in the world or the record levels of, of the installation of renewable energy. In one year, Mr Speaker, there's been more installation of renewable energy in this country than in six years of the Labor government, Mr Speaker. And at the same time, at the same time as achieving these targets, Mr Speaker, over that same period of time, we've seen a 45 per cent increase in the size of our economy. But interestingly, Mr Speaker, when you look at the time that we have been in government, the uh, CPI figures yesterday showed that electricity prices under our government, Mr Speaker, went up by 3 per cent. Over the Labor Party's period of time, Mr Speaker, they went up by 101 per cent, Mr Speaker. So under Labor, your electricity prices are higher, Mr Speaker, your taxes are higher, Mr Speaker, and your emissions were higher as well, Mr Speaker. Because under our government, Mr Speaker, we've been getting emissions down. We've been keeping electricity prices down, Mr Speaker. We've been getting the number of jobs up. We now have a million people in manufacturing jobs. Under Labor, one in eight manufacturing jobs gone, Mr Speaker. Gone, Mr Speaker, because of the economy-destroying policies of the Labor Party when they were last in government. Now I know, Mr Speaker, that our government can stand up for Australia to protect our interests and to have an Australian plan, Mr Speaker. An Australian plan that is done in Australia's interests to a deal with Australia's economy. That's what we've been doing, Mr. Speaker, and we have the strength to pursue that plan and bring the country together, Mr. Speaker, and pursue that target that we've set. Mr. Speaker, those the offices don't Prime have the Minister's strength to do that, Mr. Has Speaker. Concluded. The member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. And following on from those comments from the Prime Minister, uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister please outline to the House how the Morrison government is delivering on its plans to secure Australia's economic future and keep Australia safe, including by reopening the nation through increased COVID-19 vaccine rates? The Prime Minister has the Thank you, call. Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Leichhardt for his question. And I, I'm so pleased, as I know the member uh, is also, but more importantly the people of Leichhardt are so pleased that the member for Leichhardt was putting himself forward again at the next election, yeah. Mr Speaker. He stood with us as a coalition for many, many years, one of the most experienced and dedicated members of this House and a champion of North Queensland, Mr Speaker. And at the last election he and I stood together. And we told the Australian people, Mr Speaker, together with the government members, that we were going to build our economy to secure Australia's future. And, Mr Speaker, at that time none of us could have known the challenges that would come Australia's way at the time of the last election, in particular in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic and the global recession that followed from that pandemic. But, Mr Speaker, the national plans that we have put in place over the course 
of this parliamentary term have served that purpose to secure Australians' future, that despite the challenges and uncertainty that we have faced as a country, Australians can still plan for their future with confidence. Our COVID response plan and the national plan to reopen Australia is effective, is working, Mr Speaker, is opening up the country. 75 per cent double dose vaccination rates now achieved across the country, three quarters of those aged over 16 having been vaccinated. We have one of the lowest rates of fatalities of COVID-19 in the world. We are one of the strongest economies to power through the COVID-19 pandemic and the recession that followed it, Mr Speaker. And now we are on our way to having the highest COVID-19 vaccine rates around the world. And today we have announced a booster program, Mr Speaker. There are enough vaccines in Australia, not only for the boosters, but for everyone who wants one to get one and to assure, particularly in Western Australia and Queensland, that those rates can rise. Our economic recovery plan that the Treasurer has led and the budgets, Mr Speaker, that he's brought down, lower taxes, infrastructure spending, skills spending, manufacturing and energy, defence industry, recycling, Mr Speaker, our rare earths and critical minerals strategy in the resources sector, our agricultural 2030 plan and the record investments going to science research and, of course, our national plan to ensure that we can achieve our target of net zero emissions by 2050, Mr Speaker, without taxes, without putting burdens on Australians or targeting sectors or telling Australians what they should be doing. Our national security plan, Mr Speaker, which was realised again last night where Australia was the first country to achieve a comprehensive strategic partner with ASEAN. This is a significant achievement, Mr Speaker, and I commend the Minister for Foreign Affairs and be able to present at the East Asia Summit as ASEAN's first comprehensive strategic partner is a great advantage for Australia. But that's backed up by our leadership through the Quad Nations. It's backed up through the partnerships formed through AUKUS and our record defence spending, as well as keeping kids safe online, Mr Speaker, and keeping our borders safe. Prime These Prime national Minister's plans, Mr Speaker, are delivering concluded. for Australia. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can he confirm the government ridiculed renewable energy targets then flipped, tried to abolish the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and Arena then flipped, railed against electric vehicles then flipped, and attacked net zero before adopting it? Why should Australians trust a government with net zero credibility on Australia's clean energy future? The Prime Minister. Speaker. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is just incapable of telling the truth. Mr Speaker, that is not the position I have adopted. I have opposed the Labor Party's policies on their approaches to addressing many of those issues. But, Mr Speaker, as we know right now, the Labor Party is voting against hydrogen, Mr Speaker, to be used in infrastructure for vehicles, and they're voting against it in the Senate. They're voting against carbon capture and use and storage, Mr Speaker. They're voting against renewable technologies that we want to finance through ARENA and the CFC, Mr Speaker. They're voting against it. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. M members on both sides, member for MacArthur. You just better watch out. You've done your chair duty for the day, so you're, you're vulnerable. <laughs> the, the manager of opposition oh, business. Uh, on direct relevance, the, the answer's not relevant. It's untrue. It's weird. The manager of opposition business, to say I was fairly tolerant with the language in the question, um, which really could have meant anything when you're using words like flipped. Um, so I'm going to keep listening to the, to the Prime Minister. I was reluctant to sort of rule the question out of order, but uh, the Prime Minister has the, has the call. Well, well, thank you, Mr Speaker. What I was referring to is we have a bill in the House, in the Senate right now, that is seeking support and I should say that they're seeking to disallow the regulations, Mr Speaker. That's what the Labor Party is seeking to do for our policies, which include $72 million to support electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicle charging infrastructure, $52 million for microgrids in regional Australia, $20 million to look at how we can make heavy trucks more fuel efficient, $47 million to help heavy industry become uh, to reduce their energy consumption, the Labor Party has voted against, to, to, against these policies seven times, Mr Speaker. I'm asked about the issue of trust in the question. I'm asked about the issue of trust. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I saw this quote just yesterday, I think it was today. If I was a coal miner, a power generation worker, a manufacturing worker, 
and wanted to look at the bona fides of the ALP about how they deal with just transition. If you just look say, at I what happened to the Victorian no, no, timber the workers— the, the Prime Minister, I know he's— you know, just, there's already been a point of order on relevance. That's, that's what I took it as, anyway. And uh, I know the Prime Minister's picked out a, a word, and certainly the way the question was framed, what he was saying up until then was perfectly fine, because uh, the question made an accusation about the, the government's credibility. But I don't think, well, I, I know on this one he can't now move um, to um, talk about the opposition. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. I'll have to save for later, Mr. Speaker. I'll have to save yeah. it for later, Mr. Speaker. But, mm. Mr. Speaker, um, well, I don't, I don't Labor is not on your when, side when you out the right there question. if you're working in those industries. That's what uh, union leaders themselves are saying, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, our plan, our plan, Mr. Speaker, is about achieving net zero by 2050 without taking people's jobs, without saying you have to go and mandate what they have to do, without putting taxes on them. The Labor Party, Mr. Speaker, have attacked our plan. They don't like our plan. They don't like it that it focuses only on technology to achieve this, Mr. Speaker. So I, I know this. If you're not going to achieve net zero by 2050 through technology, Mr. Speaker, there are only two other ways you can do it by taxes and heavier regulation driving jobs out of industries. That's the Labor Party's plan. The member for Cowper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on how the Morrison-Joyce government is providing vital infrastructure to support regional communities and economies? And is the Deputy Prime Minister aware of any alternative policies? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question and note so member much work McEwen. that he has done in making the Pacific Highway safer. And obviously, especially in its latest iteration, the work that he is doing consistently for the people of the city of Coffs Harbour with the Coffs Harbour bypass. Mr. Speaker, this is a $1.8 billion project, uh, $1.46 billion coming from the federal government. But it's not just on Members the big on projects; it's also on the on the smaller projects, such as the Hatch Road and the sealing of the Hatch Road or the Maclay Valley and Family Community Centre. Mr Speaker, in, uh, in my conversations with the member for Cowper, we have also talked about projects into the future that we have to sit down and consider how we deal with, especially the road that goes between Kempsey and Wallamumby, or the, Taylor Arm, or the Taylor's Arm Road, approximately 60 kilometres, which just has had no work on it, or the Spooners Avenue from Greenhill to Fredericton, which is just we have got to try and work out how we take that road ahead. But Mr Speaker, he also <laughs> talks about um, alternative policies, and it's incredibly important that we clearly understand that um, the member for Cowper's electorate, is in, in it is uh, the beef industry, in it is the dairy industry. Uh, it is vitally important <laughs> that people clearly understand how those industries are so imperative to the income that's earned in places like Kempsey, which is the home, home of Akubra Hats. And, uh, that these people, whether it's the Manies and the Kesbys and all those families up there, how important they are to the beef industry. And one of the things that could completely and utterly rock the beef industry <coughs> is a legislation that was brought forward that would put the impos and that would put caveats on where that industry went. Now, Mr. Speaker, we heard of uh, what has been happening in, uh, as a, in, in Glasgow and the, the movements that have been made by the <coughs> President of the United States and others towards a methane target by 2030 on 2020 levels, 30 per cent reduction. And I'm so happy and confident that that's not a path that Australia will entertain right. to go by 2030, but I don't know exactly what the Labor Party's position on this, because this would decimate it. But <coughs> the member for McMahon, I'm going to quote your press conference, so we'll get to it. And I was even less, I was even more perturbed and less confident when I've heard the member for McMahon talk about how it was a silly little debate and uh, that, of course, agriculture should be included. got no problems with that as long as it lifts them up and doesn't drag them down. As long as it lifts them up and doesn't drag them down. And his solution to methane abatement was asparagopsis. Now, asparagopsis, you can buy it in, uh, uh, in, in capsules. About 120 capsules cost you about $50. The problem is we've got close to 30 million head of cattle. And 30 million head of cattle and buying uh, and buying asparagopsis just the, the the numbers just don't work out. And he said 
He said, the member for McMahon, he said, don't worry, don't the worry. The Deputy we Prime recognize... Minister's time has concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. All the timing. <laughs> member for McEwen, the Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has refused to release the modelling of his net zero policy showing its full economic impact before he goes to Glasgow tonight. Why? The Prime Minister has well, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Call. As I've said on a number of occasions, the government will be releasing the model, will be modelling, will be releasing it in the next few weeks, and it will be there, Mr Speaker, along with our, our, our plans, Mr Speaker, that go through quite, quite, quite methodically about how we intend to achieve that target. And I'm looking forward uh, to be able to uh, point to the commitment that we're making, the target that we've set of net zero emissions by 2050, and of course the update to our 2030 target. The 2030 target, Mr Speaker, which was 26 to 28 per cent, which is what we took to the last election, and we've kept faith with that commitment. And in fact, we said we'd meet that commitment and we'd beat it, and that is exactly what we're going to do, because I'll be able to inform them uh, that we now expect that we will be able to see a 35 per cent reduction by 2030. That is our expectation. That is what the work shows, Mr Speaker. And I think that's an extraordinary, an extraordinary achievement, Mr Speaker by the Australian people, by Australian industry, and I've got to say particularly in the, the agricultural Prime sector, Minister Mr Speaker. The Prime will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of yes, order. Mr Speaker, on, on relevance, it was a really specific question. There was no rhetoric just about modelling and why isn't it being produ produced now? Why? The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. I listened. Obviously, I've been listening carefully to the Prime Minister. Um, I think he's being relevant uh, to the question. Certainly was in the first couple of sentences. It mightn't be uh, the the answer uh, that those on my left wanted, but I'll keep I'll keep hearing the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So um, that's what we'll be doing when we go to Glasgow. Um, we as a we as a coalition have worked solidly together to understand fully the implications of these of these nationally determined contributions that we've made. We have worked through these issues. We've considered what is happening in the global economy and the impacts, particularly on rural and regional areas. And we have developed the plan, Mr Speaker, which enables us to achieve this and at the same time see our economy continue to grow and the way of life in rural and regional communities continue to go forward, Mr Speaker. That is what our plan achieves. Our targets are clear. 26 to 28 per cent by 2030, Mr Speaker, which we'll meet and beat, and by 2050 to achieve a target of net zero emissions, Mr Speaker. We still don't know what the Labor Party's 2030 target is, and the clock has been ticking on them for a long time. Members on my left, members on my right, the member for Indi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <laughs> and my question is to the Minister for Health. Right now, Albury Wodonga is experiencing the biggest outbreak of COVID-19 since the pandemic began. Likewise, there are increasing numbers of cases in Wangaratta and neighbouring towns. At the same time, the city visitation to the regions opens this weekend. The rural health workforces are under enormous strain. What is the federal government doing to guarantee health workforce capacity to regional towns like Wodonga and Wangaratta so health services can handle these COVID outbreaks and meet ongoing local health needs? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, want to thank the uh, the member for Indi as, as well as the member for Farah, uh, who has uh, been making uh, repeated uh, steps forward and working with the government uh, to support uh, the border regions on both sides. And so, to acknowledge both members for for their work, uh, we are very aware of a significant outbreak which has now seen over 450 cases across the border regions on the Albury and the Wodonga side. Uh, in particular, uh, we uh, are working with uh, both state governments as well as, both, as well as both communities to address this challenge. Uh, with, firstly, in relation to vaccination, I'm pleased to be able to report that uh, in the Albury LGA they have reached 98 per cent vaccination coverage and in the Wodonga LGA 97.7, so two of Australia's most vaccinated local government areas. And to see that in a regional area I think is, is very heartening. It provides important protection for both of those communities. There are over 30 
vaccination sites, Commonwealth vaccination sites uh, across the uh, two communities. I think uh, 18 general practices, 11 uh, uh, pharmacies, uh, one Indigenous uh, medical service, and in addition to that, uh, we have one Commonwealth vaccination clinic. So, 31 Commonwealth sites which have been providing vaccinations. Uh, a further thing which is extremely important is, of course, the, uh, the testing. And uh, this has been raised uh, by both members, the member for Farrah and the member for Indi, uh, with me. And at this stage, we have a pop-up clinic at Lavington Sports Ground, a drive-through clinic at Albury Showground, a pathology clinic in Lavington, walk-in testing at Wodonga Respiratory oh. Clinic, drive-through testing at the Wodonga <laughs> campus of Al Albury Wodonga Health. Importantly, um, we've been working with the Victorian government and uh, the Victorian Deputy Chief Health Officer Ben Cowie has uh, stated publicly that they have responded and will be providing additional testing resources uh, this weekend. And I think that that's a very important message to uh, the people on both sides of the border that uh, those uh, uh, representations have resulted in increased testing activity. Uh, my office has also been working with uh, private rapid antigen test providers. Rapid antigen tests will be available from the 1st of November, and they have confirmed uh, that there will be strong and significant supply within the border <laughs> regions. That will grow uh, through pharmacies and convenience providers uh, over the course of the first two weeks, but will be available from the start of November. Finally, in terms of PPE, uh, we've now made three deliveries in, uh, in recent uh, weeks. Uh, to support the health services, so Commonwealth National Medical Stockpile deliveries uh, on the uh, 14th, 18th and 26th of October of uh, P2 masks, surgical masks, gloves, gowns, goggles, shields uh, and sanitizers. So all of these things are coming together as part of the Commonwealth's response, and I thank both the member for Farrah and the member for Indi for their representations. The member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasury remind the House how the Morrison's government ongoing commitment to delivering lower taxes will strengthen our economic rebound as COVID-19 restrictions ease? Is the Treasurer aware of any alternative policies? The Treasurer has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for O'Connor for his question. Acknowledge him as a third generation wheat farmer, Mr Speaker, and with an electorate that is more than 866 that square thousand square kilometres. It's more than three times larger than the state of Victoria, more than eleven times larger than the state of Tasmania, and it's a powerhouse for mining, for agriculture, and for tourism. And the member for O'Connor, like others on this side of the house, understand that we stand for more jobs and lower taxes. Now, the member for Rankin, the shadow treasurer, said last year that the government should be judged on what happens to unemployment. That were his words. The government should be judged on what happens to unemployment. The member for Rankin said the most important test of this government's management of recession is what happens to jobs. Well, I can inform the member for Rankin, as I can inform the rest of the House, that when we came to government, the unemployment rate was 5.7 per cent. And today, it's 4.6 per cent, Mr Speaker. An additional 1.4 million people are in work than when we came to government. And that we know that of those 1.4 million jobs, 58 per cent went to women. And we're also focused on driving down taxes. And we've legislated through the parliament more than $300 billion of income tax cuts. So if you're a teacher or a tradie on $60,000 a year, you pay $6,480 less tax as a result of the tax cuts that we've legislated through the last three budgets alone. And our immediate expensing provisions have, have, have helped drive increased investment in machinery and equipment, whether it's a farmer getting a new harvester, a tradie getting new tools. And we've also put in place Mr. Speaker, other tax incentives like cutting the company tax rate down to 25 per cent for businesses with a turnover of $50 million or less. 
and our tax cuts, together with our infrastructure programs, together with our other measures to cut red tape, together with what we've done on insolvency, Mr. Speaker, what we've been doing on digital platforms, what we've been doing on foreign investment with historic reforms, these are all designed to create more jobs across the economy. But we know that those opposite only stand for higher taxes and more spending. We saw that at the last election with $387 billion of higher taxes that they took to the Australian people. The member for McMahon said to the Australian people, if you don't like our tax policies, don't vote for them. They took them literally, and they know that we on this side of the House stand for more jobs and lower taxes, and we have delivered exactly the that. Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and it follows my last question about why it is that modelling for his net zero policy has not been released. Is he aware that a senior official has just told Senate estimates to quote, we are finalising the writing up of that work? Ah. <laughs> End quote. How is it, how is it that this Prime Minister released his so-called plan, where he said plan 94 times between him and the minister, but doesn't actually have one and doesn't have the modelling that he can table? The time has concluded. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Modelling will be released in the next couple of weeks, Mr. Speaker. Will be there for everybody Members on to my see. left. Will be there for everybody to see, Mr. Speaker. The plan has been released. I've tabled it in the Parliament. Members uh, on my form left. Part of our nationally determined contribution at COP26, Mr. Speaker. The member for McEwen will leave under Standing Order 94A. The Prime Minister has the call. It sets out. The member for Kingsford Smith will follow him. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It sets out that our our. 2030 commitment. Um, our government has a 2030 commitment, Mr. Speaker. The, the opposition still doesn't have a 2030 target at all. I mean, they don't have one, Mr. Speaker. So they can't speak of one because it isn't there, Mr. Speaker. We have one. We took it at the last election. It was supported by the Australian people. Um, the Labor Party had one. It was 45 per cent. It was rejected by the Australian people, and they've been sitting there twiddling their thumbs about what it should be ever since. No, they don't know whether it should be higher. The Prime, they don't Prime know Minister, it be less, there wasn't a, less, Mr. Speaker. There wasn't an opportunity in this question to to speak about the opposition policies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the net zero by 2050 position that the government has arrived at has been arrived at based on the on the modelling that has been done by the government, Mr. Speaker, through the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, Mr. Speaker, a highly a highly competent department, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, led by Secretary Fredericks, Mr. Speaker, who I know is well regarded uh, around the public service, Mr. Speaker, and that that document will be released in the next few weeks and. It'll be there, Mr. Speaker. It'll be there, Mr. Speaker, and they'll be able to see it. And they'll be able to see, Mr. Speaker, that what it does through the plan that we're putting in place with technology, not taxes, with, uh, not, with respecting people's choices Member and not seeking to, to legislate warned. what people should do in their lives, in their businesses, on their farms, in their minds, Mr. Speaker. That's what the Labor Party wants to do, not us. No, just... We want to let the Australian economy achieve this target, and we know it can. We know that Australians can achieve this because emissions have already fallen by more than 20 per cent. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. On direct relevance, the question goes to the Prime Minister being asked about modelling and never once letting us know the document the, no, doesn't no, even the, exist. The Manager of Opposition Business won't use the opportunity to try and give a statement or ask, ask a different question. Has the Prime Minister concluded? Okay, well, just, before, just, before you, just before you recommence, um, the, there isn't an opportunity to talk about opposition policies um, in his answer, but the Prime Minister— Because they don't have any, Mr <laughs> Speaker. They don't have any targets. They no, don't the have any plans for their 2050. So I, I can't help there, Mr no, Speaker. Well, maybe, I'm sorry. No, maybe you, maybe and you I'm happy to, wind to up conclude on that note. <laughs> The member for Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Will the Minister please update the House on Australia's vaccine rollout and when booster vaccines will become available for all Australians? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Lindsay and also to thank uh, her community for coming forward to be vaccinated in record numbers, approximately 95 per cent uh, of uh, 
the uh, Penrith uh, community have come forward to be vaccinated, and that's protecting them. And it's protecting them in a world where, again, we've seen over 500,000 cases in the last 24 hours, over 8,500 lives lost worldwide. And so the pandemic continues. But in Australia, what we are seeing is ever increasing vaccination numbers. So we are now at the point where we have one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, one of the most recently vaccinated populations, and we are about to commence one of the world's first whole of population booster programs. In terms of that vaccination, uh, we've now passed 35 million vaccinations in Australia, 87.6 per cent of the 16 and over population in Australia has had at least the first dose. We have passed three quarters of the 16 and over population being fully vaccinated with a second dose in Australia, with 75 and a half per cent. And then as we look across different demographics and communities, over 94.8 per cent of the people 50 and above have been vaccinated, and an extraordinary 98.8 per cent of Australians who are 70 and above, surely one of the highest rates in the world for the elderly in a community to be vaccinated. And that protection is absolutely fundamental in saving lives and protecting lives. But as we go forwards, yesterday we had the TGA approve uh, the uh, Pfizer vaccine as a booster. Today we've had the advice from ATAGI confirming and recommending that we begin that whole of population booster program. The first shots were administered shortly before question time by TLC at their Geelong residential aged care facility. And they are already commencing that booster program for older Australians. Uh, we're also making available, as of November the 8th, the whole of population booster program. But those GPs, those states or those facilities that are in a position to begin beforehand have the capacity to do that immediately, as we've seen already today with that booster program commencing. So all of these things have come together to protect Australians, one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, one of the most recently vaccinated populations, and now, after Israel, one of the first nations in the world to have a whole of country vaccination booster program. The the Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I seek leave to move the following motion. Members on my this right. House condemns the Prime Minister for misleading the Parliament and the Australian people by not telling them that the modelling document for his net zero policy does not exist. Leave granted. The Leader of the House. <laughs> No, no, leave is not granted for such a stupid motion. No, 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 the Leader of the House will resume his seat. <laughs> Members on both sides, the, the Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I move that so much as standing and sessional orders be suspended as would allow the Leader of the Opposition to move the following motion that this House condemns the Prime Minister for misleading the Parliament and the Australian people by not telling them that the modelling document for his net zero policy does not exist. Mr Speaker, if they had the courage of their conviction, they'd have a debate on climate change. The and they could have it Leader right of the now. Opposition will Our resume his seat. The Leader of the House says the Court. Mr Speaker, I move the matter be no longer heard. The question is the Leader of the opposition be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. If the ayes have it, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Locked the doors. Question is the Leader of the Opposition be no further heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Nichols and Gray, tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Werriwa and Lawler, tell us for the noes. <coughs> Order. The result of the division is ayes 54, noes 49. The questions therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? The member for McMahon. Seconded. This modelling is not worth the paper it's not written on. It's so secret, it's blank. The this is, this member is for modelling McMahon, which doesn't exist. Seat. The Leader of the House has Speaker, the, I move the member be no longer heard. The question is the member for McMahon be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
We'll lock the doors. I appoint the same tellers as the previous division. Members must remain in their seats unless they're changing their vote or didn't vote in the last division, in which case they need to report to the tellers. <coughs> Order the result of the division is ayes 54, noes 49. The question is therefore resolved. And the affirmative of the question now is that the motion be disagreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. I appoint the same tellers as the previous division. Members must remain in their seats unless they're changing their vote or did not vote in the last division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Order. The result of the division is ayes 56, noes 46. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative and I call the member for Barara. My question is to the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction. Can the Minister outline to the House how the Morrison government's plan to reduce emissions is focused on technology and how this approach is already working? Is the Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reductions. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I, I thank the member for his question. And he has seen throughout his career the power of technology to solve hard problems, and he knows central to our plan to get to net zero by 2050 is a technology-led approach, Mr Speaker. Technologies like hydrogen, ultra-low-cost Solar, carbon capture and storage, regenerating our soils, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Low Member emission for steel Cooper. and aluminium, uh, low cost energy storage capacity, Mr. Speaker. All of these are central to the plan, Mr. Speaker, and, and our approach is already working. Emissions down 20.8 per cent at the same time as we've seen a 45 per cent increase in our economy and more than 200 per cent increase in our goods exports, Mr. Speaker. We'll meet and beat our 2030 target. We've reduced emissions faster than every other major commodity exporting country in the world, Mr Speaker. And we've seen how solar can bring down emissions in recent years. Now, now 90 per cent of the world's solar has been installed in the last 10 years, Mr Speaker, and that's because of 50 years of cost reductions averaging 12 per cent a year. This is an extraordinary outcome. and We are on our way to ultra-low-cost solar. At that rate, by the early 2030s, we will reach a point where solar will be at $15 a megawatt hour. Mr. Speaker. And 90 per cent of those cells around the world, those PV cells, have Australian intellectual property embedded in them. Mr. Speaker. That is the approach we are taking in our plan. Now, there is an alternative, Mr Speaker. There is an alternative. It is a carbon tax, 
But there's another part to that alternative, which is legislating a net zero target, Mr. Speaker, a blank cheque. Now, a number of other countries have done this. A number of other countries have done this, including the United Member Kingdom, Mr. Speaker. And in the United Kingdom, activists have launched a legal action against a £27 billion program to upgrade roads and fill potholes, Mr. Speaker. Up upgrade roads and fill potholes. And I'll those taking actions say that hitting carbon tax targets requires making driving less attractive too. Making driving less attractive. But they go on, Mr. Speaker, because the Transport Action Network that's dragging the UK government through the courts has a strategy for thousands of miles of speed cameras. Thousands of miles of speed cameras, not 50 major road schemes, Mr. Speaker. But it's not just happening in the UK. Germany has legislated a net zero target, and in Germany the Constitutional Court is forcing the government to make deeper and harsher cuts. In France, the top administrative court, where they have a legislated net zero target, is threatening to fine the French government if they don't take all necessary actions. Those opposite want a hand of power. The bringing down time to has the concluded. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. Did the Prime Minister tell the Deputy Prime Minister the modelling was still being written up when the Deputy Prime Minister signed up to net zero? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. And, uh, the Prime Minister has just handed me the, the actual quote, which I think is very important. And the part they've left out is the actual modelling had, of course, been finalised at that point. But, Members but on the my right left. of it, we just need to take a little extra time to ensure that it's written up clearly and able to be presented well to the Australian public. So uh, when you read it in its entirety, Mr. Speaker, it's entirely <coughs> different to the proposition that the opposition are putting forward to, to, this, to this House. And it goes to show you how, at times, how sneaky, sneaky they can be. Very, very sneaky. And because, you see, Mr Speaker, they're sneaky, they'll probably be very sneaky with the legislation that they intend to bring forward. And see, the sneaky legislation they intend to bring forward will legislate we, unless they can tell us otherwise, people out of a job. Legislate their coal miners in Musselbrook out of a job. Legislate the, oh, the, the coal the miners in Deputy Prime out Minister of a job. straying from the question. Yep. Mr. Mrs. Mr. Speaker, I've now been in, and I've now been informed, it, and it seems completely logical, of the entirety of the quote, and the entirety of the quote <coughs> completely dispenses with the premise of the question. <laughs> The member for Moncrief. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Will the Minister inform the House on the Morrison government's significant investment in defence capability and how it's working with regional partners to keep Australia safe and secure? And is the Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Defence has the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the honourable member for her question. I want to thank her too for her commitment to the veterans on the Gold Coast, particularly around yeah, Anzac Day and yeah, yeah. days of national significance, and it wouldn't come as any surprise that, at least in part, that passion comes from her own family history. We know that uh, the honourable member has two great uncles who were rats of Tobruk, and so that is an incredible family history and one to be very proud of. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Morrison government uh, is absolutely proud of the way in which we support our troops and the way in which we provide them with a very significant investment to make over the course of the next 10 years of some $270 billion. And, Mr Speaker, that is about investing in the equipment that we need to keep Australia safe and that we need to provide the troops with to keep our country safe. It is, Mr Speaker, a record investment. It is now in excess of 2 per cent of GDP. And we know, Mr Speaker, that that stands in stark contrast to the Labor Party, because, and I am asked about alternative approaches, the defence budget under the Labor Party fell, wait for this, to 1.56 per cent of GDP. It was the lowest level 
since 1938. So we live, Mr. Speaker, in a region now in the Indo-Pacific that we know is more uncertain than any time since that time, since the Second World War, Mr. Speaker. We have uncertainty in our region, and if we were relying on the Labor Party now to provide support and security and safety to our country, they have a track record of taxing and taking money away from the Defence Force, Member Mr. For Speaker. Gordon. That's the reality. Now, why would they do that, Member Mr. Gordon. Speaker? Because the Australian public understands that when it comes to border protection and when it comes to defending our nation, the Labor Party, at its heart, in its DNA, is weak, Mr. Speaker. It's weak because on these issues it's dragged to the left by their buddies in the Greens. And, Mr. Speaker, they make decisions when they're in government that are always against the interests of the Australian Defence Force, Mr. Speaker. They make those decisions by taking money away, Mr. Speaker, by taking money away from our troops. And, Mr. Speaker, they take money away that should be invested in keeping our country safe. Now, Mr. Speaker, it is quite remarkable that our AUKUS construct has come together to keep Australians safe, but our compacts and our friends extend well beyond the United Kingdom and the United States. This, uh, Mr. Speaker, is evidenced in ASEAN at the Australian Leaders' Summit last night. Our country was represented by the Prime Minister. It was agreed to establish a comprehensive strategic partnership between ASEAN and Australia. This is the first time ASEAN has entered into such an arrangement and we'll continue to work the with our close friends to keep our country safe. Concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why is the Prime Minister seeking to suppress Australians' right to vote and importing Trump-style attacks on democracy into Australian politics on the eve of an election? Given the Australian Electoral Commission has confirmed there were no prosecutions, not one, for multiple voting at the last election, isn't the only reason the Prime Minister is doing this is to deny many Australians a vote, <coughs> particularly those from remote communities. The Prime Minister has the Mr. Call. Speaker, I'll ask the Special Minister of State to address the, the bill that has been put forward based on the recommendations of the Joint Standing Committee on Ele Electoral Matters, not once, Mr. Speaker, but twice. And uh, the proposition that the government seeks to progress based on that recommendation, Mr. Speaker, is that people who go to vote should be able to say who they are and prove who they are, Mr. Speaker, in a, in a democracy. And, 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 Mr. Speaker, this is policies that are pursued by Canada, Mr. Speaker. The last time I, I noticed, I didn't see Justin Trudeau looking very much like the former president of the United States, Mr. Speaker. We respect them both. We respect all, all of our partners, leaders, Mr. Speaker, because they're democratically elected with a democratic process which has integrity and the savings provisions under the declaration votes, as the Leader of the Opposition would well know, will ensure that under our proposals every vote will count, every vote will matter, Mr Speaker. But those opposite, those opposite, Mr Speaker, you've got to really ask yourself why they don't want people to have to prove who they are when they vote. The Special Minister of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It, you really have to wonder why the Labor Party this morning took action against this bill before even reading it. What is it that scares them so much about having integrity in our electoral system? Mr Speaker, not only has JSCAM recommended this in 2019, it recommended it in 2016 after the election. And Mr Speaker, I actually thought that the report after the 2013 election Mr Speaker, was very well written and I refer members to it. This bill will ensure that the Australian electoral system comes into line with other Liberal democracies like Canada, France, Belgium, Sweden and all but 14 states in the US. The United Kingdom is introducing this legislation. But before the Labor Party even see the details on this bill, Mr Speaker, they are in here trashing it. Now, interestingly, in Queensland, in the last three elections, there have been one instance of requiring voter ID. And it was in that election there was a higher turnout than in the two subsequent elections without it, Mr Speaker. What, the Labor Party is against this for all the wrong reasons, Mr Speaker. And one has to wonder what they are. You have to show ID to pick up a parcel at the post office, Mr Speaker. Yet this lot won't allow a more integrity in our electoral system to ensure that 
the right people are having their names marked off at the roll. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I have to question the motivation of those opposite. Taking action this morning against the bill before you see the detail makes you wonder. Members on both sides, the member for Chisholm has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education and Youth. With many students in my electorate returning to school this week, why is it so important to have a national curriculum that lifts standards and ensure kids are taught about the origins of our strong liberal democracy? What has been the response from parents and teachers to the Morrison government's calls for such a curriculum? The Minister for Education. Can I thank the member for Chisholm for her question? And she, like me, is a very proud Melbourneian and is so pleased to see kids returning to the classrooms in Melbourne this week and then further next week as well, meaning the kids right across our great country will be returning in line with our, our national member plan. For Mr. Speaker, the member for Chisholm as you know, is a great Australian, and she's like so many of the millions of migrants who came to this country over the past few decades because of the freedom, the opportunity and the democracy which this country offers. And she wants to ensure that the next generation also, like us on, on, this, side of the on this side of the House, are educated about the origins of our liberal democracy and have high standards in our classroom, which is why we are working so hard to ensure that that national curriculum does those things. And this view, Mr Speaker, is shared right across Australia by everyday mums and dads and by teachers. For example, in the member for Chisholm's own electorate, May Lee um, says that thank you for standing up for the future of our next generation. Yeah. We've got in the member for Cowan's electorate Marlene from Warwick who says, I also agree that a truthful history of our nation must be taught. Thank you for your concern and for voicing it strongly. In the member, in the member for Morden's electorate, uh, Philip and Sue from Acacia Ridge, they write in, thank you for looking for an A-plus education curriculum for future generations. And even in the member for Karangamites electorate, Mr. Speaker, Peter and Rosita uh, from Winchelsea, they write, we firmly believe that we have a duty to teach the next generation about our true heritage. Mr. Speaker, those types of views have been shared by mums and dads, by teachers, by grandparents right across our vast continent because they, like us, want to ensure that standards are high that the origins of our liberal democracy are taught fully in the classroom so that the next generation will defend our democracy in a similar manner to what previous generations have. And it seems, Mr Speaker, that the only people who don't share this view of wanting to have a positive view of Australia, wanting kids to have high standards, wanting kids to understand the origins of our liberal democracy, is those opposite who suggest that that concept is weird. Mr Speaker, we don't think this concept is weird. Mums and dads don't think it's weird to want high standards. Mums and dads don't think it's weird to want to learn the origins of our liberal democracy and have pride in this great country because we live in one of the greatest countries, Mr Speaker, in the world. And, pe and kids should go through schooling, understanding the origins of it and being absolutely proud of this great nation. Members on both sides, the member for Lingiari. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer to his attempt to suppress voting rights in, the, in Australia. Has the Prime Minister no understanding of the impact this move will have on remote communities across this country, or does he know exactly how it will suppress the vote? And this is precisely why he's doing it. The Leader of the House. Well, Mr Speaker, I uh, suggest to you that uh, that question, the way in which it was framed at least, <coughs> offends the standing orders. I mean, it has all sorts of imputations which are baseless, incorrect and, frankly, a slur that is, I think, uh, beneath this member of the parliament and it should be ruled out of order. 
I've um, yeah, listened carefully to the Leader of the House. Um, question time is robust, as I certainly know, but they are questions, and I have consistently adopted the approach of former Speaker Andrew, um, who you know, certainly uh, had a more liberal ruling than some earlier speakers. And that simply is that if I was to rule questions like that out of order, it really just allows the matter to stand and there's no capacity to respond to it as vigorously as you like. So I've got the question here in front of me. Um, the first part of it is an accusation and, uh, and then there's, there's two questions. So I will rule the question in order and the Special Minister of State will answer. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. I might refer you to my last answer, where I told the House that in the 2015 state election in Queensland, Mr Speaker, the turnout where it was higher. That was an election where voter ID was in Member place. In 2017, Mr Speaker, and in 2020, Mr Speaker, where voter ID was not in place, turnout was lower. So you just can't accept the claims of those opposite, Mr Speaker. In fact, you have to wonder about their motivation, that they will actually make claims against this legislation that are incorrect. Now, it is true that the Minister for Indigenous Australians and I today announced an additional $9.4 million to, to uh, continue our success with Indigenous communities with targeted measures to enlist their participation in our electoral system, including their enrolment. In fact, this is on top of the 5.6 million, Mr. Speaker, um, that was delivered in the 2021 MyEFO. Now, let me tell you about uh, Indigenous enrolment. The Indigenous enrolment rate has lifted from 74.7 per cent in 2017, Mr. Speaker, to 79.3 per cent in 2021. I, Mr. Speaker, this is a government that is committed to ensuring greater involvement in our electoral system, including from Indigenous Australians. And I look forward to working with the Minister for Indigenous Australians to lift Indigenous participation in our electoral system. But those opposite will use a range of arguments in order to, in order to defeat Member this bill. Lingiari. This morning, before even having an opportunity to read the detail of the bill, including the fact that this bill will allow Indigenous Australians to use documents from Indigenous land, Indigenous land councils, they, they, they took action against this bill not knowing the details. There is, a motive, there is a sickness in their motivation against it, and the more they continue to rally against voter ID that is in place, like in Sweden, like in Canada, like in France, like in all but 14 states in the US, and is being introduced in the UK, Australians have the right to question that motivation. Now, under this legislation, Mr Speaker, not one voter will be turned away from a polling booth for any reason. There will be an opportunity for them to have their identity attested to by another enrolled voter with identification, and there will be an opportunity for them to cast a declaration vote. The scare campaign from those opposite in relation to the electoral system and quite frankly, the passion they've put into a debate about the voting system in comparison to a variety of other issues does make you wonder if those opposite have the right priorities for the Australian people. The member for Gippsland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, representing the Minister for Emergency Management, and I note the black summer bushfires which devastated large areas of my electorate of Gippsland. Will the minister please update the House on the progress that our federal government has made on the implementation of recommendations from the Royal Commission into national natural disaster arrangements? The Minister for Agriculture, Northern Australia, and the Minister representing Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I thank the member for Gippsland for his question and acknowledge his extraordinary leadership, not just during that bushfire, but also in helping his community recover and to all the members of parliament on both sides of the house for their leadership of their communities in rebuilding them. And part of that, today, 12 months ago, I handed into this parliament the report into the, the, the Royal Commission report into the natural disasters. 
uh, I'm proud to say that of the 80, 80 recommendations, 15 were towards the federal government. We have completed in full nine of those. The five that are to be completed are on track to be completed as <coughs> outlined through that report. We are working with the states and ensuring that the balance that are shared and that they own themselves are working in collaboration to achieve that. Proudly, we've been able to make sure that those recommendations have been implemented around particularly the National Emergency Declaration Act that was put into this parliament uh, nearly 12 months ago. We've also created the National Recovery and Resiliency Agency that will look after all natural disasters into the future, making sure that we have a national approach. We've also stood up the Climate Services Australia that will bring together the data of over 10 federal agencies to make sure that not only do our emergency service personnel have real-time data in addressing these, agents, in these uh, disasters, but also preparing for the recovery immediately. We've also stood up uh, Emergency Management Australia and enhanced their capabilities with over $23 million to make sure that they have enhanced capabilities to, to support states. And we've created a, a, warning, a national warning system and a national fire danger rating system to make sure that there's consistency right across this country so there's no confusion amongst our communities. We've also worked with the states to streamline our disaster recovery funding arrangements. And importantly, we've put $4 million out, as per the report, to acquire a national air tanker, large aerial tanker. That takes our commitment up to $30 million a year, not just in the standing costs of having these planes, these suite of aircraft, to be sitting on the tarmac, but also we cover the costs of operation when required. We've also put $88 million into research into the Bushfire Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre to ensure that we have the best research in the world to support our emergency service personnel. And we've also ensured that there's over $37 million that have gone into improving telecommunications during natural disasters, particularly focusing on those areas that were impacted by the bushfires this year. We've spent $600 million has now been allocated to infrastructure at household level and at community level to build better preparedness infrastructure to support our communities, uh, partnering with the states with over $130 million uh, in also further programs and part of the ERF, there's $50 million that have gone out to flood mitigation. We've achieved a lot. There's a lot more to do, but we've also learned a lot in ensuring that Australians will stay safer in the future. The member for Lilly. There were no prosecutions for multiple voting at the last election. Why is the Prime Minister now trying to suppress the vote and make Australians spend even more of their weekend queuing in long lines around the block? The Special Minister of State. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The most important issue in front of the people of Australia is this one, uh, according to those opposite. Mr Speaker, of course, in the introduction of these bills, the, the government is ensuring that the Australian Electoral Commission is resourced to ensure um, that it does not um, impact in relation to times uh, at the voting booth. But you know what? These, what this is showing you is that those opposite are going to use every excuse to fight against a, a provision that is used in, in a lot of liberal-like democracies in, around the world, Mr. Speaker. You know, the, 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 they, they talk about voter su suppression, and I just want to again reiterate the three last elections in Queensland. One of them had voter ID. One of them had voter ID. Two of them didn't. The member for the one with and voter the member for ID, Lily. with the highest level of integrity, had a higher turnout than the two without it, Mr. Speaker. So they will use any excuse opposite to defeat this legislation. And I tell you what, on every question they ask, Mr Speaker, I begin to, I begin to wonder more and more, more and more about what their motivations might be in relation to these issues. Now, as I said, under the way this has been designed, under the way this has been designed, which those opposite didn't even wait to, to read before they took the action this morning. The under the way this is designed, just pause. no Minister will pause. The members for Oxley and McCalla will leave the chamber under 94A. The minister has the call. So concerned about our democracy, Mr. Speaker, that those opposite moved motions to prevent this bill being debated this morning. 
before, before they read the detail of the bill. And if they had have read the detail of the bill, Mr Speaker, they would have learned that this has been designed in a way that will ensure that no voter is turned away from a voting booth. Not one voter. A person with ID can attest to the identity of another, and failing that, a declaration vote can be issued. What is it that those opposite? Um, what are they scared of? Why is it that? Why are they against it? And why are they committing so much time today to an issue that, quite obviously, the more they do, the more I realise there must be something in it for them to take this position, Mr. Speaker. There must be. I tell you what, it says something about those opposite. Um, no, yes, you're, you're, you're not telling me anything. Just yes, tell the chamber, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I was. I, I was. I mean, being asked more questions about this than I was about the national response to the child abuse yesterday. Uh, the minister will resume his seat. The member for Menzies. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I asked the minister for defence industry and the Minister for Science and Technology if she would update the House on how the Morrison government is supporting our scientists and researchers in developing new technologies that will create more Australian jobs and supporting our vital businesses and, in doing so, strengthening the Australian economy. The Minister for Defence Industry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Menzies and thank and acknowledge his service as a former Defence Minister and also his passion and interest for all uh, industries across um, his great electorate. Mr Speaker, I'm blown away almost every day by the ambition um, and the cutting-edge technologies that our Australian <coughs> businesses and researchers are developing each and every day. And just this morning, Mr. Speaker, I had the great pleasure of joining the University of New South Wales Canberra Launch Open Day. And, Mr. Speaker, it was a, I did it virtually, of course. And it was a, a, an amazing uh, event, Mr. Speaker, to hear about those world-leading technologies that Australians are developing right here at home. We should be very proud, Mr. Speaker. From Canberra's Penton, who are developing cyber security and tactical communications equipment for our ADF and international partners. Mr Speaker, despite the impacts of COVID, Penton have done amazingly well during COVID because they have now almost doubled their workforce from 80 people to 140 people, um, and they're exporting some $6 million worth of equipment to the UK last year. And I'm very pleased to say, Mr Speaker, that our government has supported Penton with a $5.4 million contract to help to advance those technologies. Also, Mr. Speaker, we heard today from Skycraft, who've designed and manufactured specialised satellites which are on track, Mr. Speaker, to launch into space with the help of SpaceX during 2022. Mr. Speaker, out at Lucas Heights in Sydney, we have ANSTO, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. It is a global leader supporting nuclear research in many fields, but most importantly, nuclear medicines that save Australian lives. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, it's estimated that on average each and every Australian stands to benefit from a nuclear medicine procedure at some point in their lifetime. With close to a quarter of a million procedures involving <laughs> nuclear medicine, such as x rays, PET scans, and also radiology, performed every year. Mr Speaker, Australians should be incredibly proud because this is a sovereign capability that we're talking about that is supporting some 1,000 jobs nationwide. And Mr Speaker, some, if not many of us in this House, will sadly know someone who has experienced some form of cancer. And it is for those reasons, Mr Speaker, that we have recently announced um, a $30 million investment um, to design a new and world-leading manufacturing facility in Sydney to produce life-saving nuclear medicines. Mr Speaker, this is the very, very first step that we're taking to replace the current facility with more modern, world-leading hub for manufacturing research and development of nuclear medicines. Mr Speaker, this builds upon our government's investment of almost $12 billion in the science research and innovation system. The member for Brand. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister actually cares about integrity in politics, 
Why won't he refer the member for Pearce to the Privileges Committee? And why won't he establish a national anti-corruption commission? Why is the government in favour of voter identification but not donor identification? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, those matters uh, were, were addressed by the Leader of the House, Mr Speaker, when they were considered before this place members, in relation members to the on referral left. issues that you've, uh, you've spoken to. The committee is already looking at these matters in broad, Mr Speaker, and I think all members of the House will be very aided by the investigation of those things, Mr Speaker, so all members of the House can be informed uh, about how they impact on them. And, Mr Speaker, in relation to the other matter, uh, we have been working steadfastly on our proposals in these areas, Mr Speaker. I remember one of the first roles I had in this place, Mr Speaker, was as the Deputy Chair of the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, and the government has always been, Mr Speaker, uh, advocating uh, responsible measures that support our democracy, um, whether it's on uh, ensuring that voters should be properly identified, Mr Speaker, and donations are properly disclosed. The member for Reid. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Will the Minister outline to the House how the national strategy to prevent and respond to child sex abuse, released yesterday by the Morrison government, will ensure that Indigenous Australian children are protected from sexual abuse? Good the question. Minister for Indigenous Australians. Can I thank the member for Reid for her question, but more importantly, for the wise counsel and advice that you give on the work that I'm doing around youth suicide and mental health. I acknowledge the level of child abuse in Indigenous communities is far too high. It is two to four times greater than the broader population. And it is a tragedy when you meet those young people later in life and they break down in front of you and share their experience of how that has impacted on them. And that's why yesterday's announcement by the Special Minister for State on the national strategy to prevent and respond to child sexual abuse is welcomed, because we will focus on place-based approaches to address the levels of child abuse. I've asked uh, two incredible Indigenous women, the Healing Foundation CEO Fiona Cornforth and the SNAKE CEO, Catherine Niddle, to co-chair the Indigenous Expert Group and guide the implementation of this initiative. And what they'll do is they will look for local solutions that empowers people at the local level. Our women have been raising this issue, as the member for Barton knows, uh, over our years of experience within our communities. It is the women who raise the issue and want the matter addressed. And I know that members on both sides of this chamber have been committed to addressing the levels of child sexual abuse within Indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. As a teacher, I saw the profound impact it had on children in their behaviour within a classroom, let alone the indelible imprint that sits within their memory banks that lasts a lifetime. And by doing it in conjunction with our women and with our communities, we will seek and obtain the solutions that we need for the future. That generation that has been affected and the victims of sexual abuse will also provide input into lived experience so that we're able to better address the issues. When the Minister for Defence was the Minister for Home Affairs, I approached him on a matter to do with a number of communities and we were working together to address that challenge in those communities, because there are people who are incarcerated and released back into communities and have unfettered access to young people. And that's what we as a government and all of us in this House are focused on addressing so that we ensure that future generations are safe, they are protected, that they have the levels of support that are absolutely critical. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice.